Good morning. Welcome to Torquera's Epistemology. My name is Travis Shaddix. I hope everything's working. I'm having some serious computer problems. <laughs> uh, if it is working, this is the first members only live stream. So I appreciate those who have been able to come today. Um, I'm having problems with the chat. I've been working all weekend trying to get the chat working and it doesn't seem to be functioning on the screen. It will, you'll see it in the live stream chat on the YouTube function chat, but not on the screen because I can't get it to work. Apparently when you put it as members only at YouTube, I don't know, changes something and I can't get it to show up. So, but I will see your chat in the YouTube chat. So I'll do my best. I worked, like I said, I worked all weekend for several hours and I'll be honest, it's extremely frustrating. I mean, I've, I'm a turf person, I'm a scientist, I'm not an IT guy, and uh, I don't really enjoy sitting for hours trying to figure out how to get things to show up in YouTube. I reached out to a couple of Turfgrass people who do live streams, but I didn't get any response from them. So until I figure it out, there's not going to be any live stream showing up on the screen in the members only, the members only, uh, on the members only streams. So, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Don't know why it's not working, but, um, yeah, so we had a good time on Thursday night. It was an interesting show. Just like I suspected that the attendance was the highest I think I've ever had almost double of what it would normally be. And so there was a lot of, a lot of people last, last Thursday night. And um, I'm hoping that it stays that way. I thought it was a good Thursday night show. So hopefully this is a good show too. Tonight, or this morning, Monday morning. Good morning, Super TA and Connecticut Cubonican. Transition is over. Chuck Benzing. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, yeah, I, went, uh, I went down to the Bahamas and Jamaica for a while. And I got sick, actually, unfortunately. I got a lung infection down there. And um, it didn't let it slow me down too much. We were, and the kids are with us, so we kind of fight through it, you know, so they can have fun. But then I got back and got antibiotics. And I'll tell you what, it's been, it's been not fun. <laughs> but I, I'm on the tail end of it now. Uh, so that's what I did over a week or so ago. And, and um, now I'm back. So... If for those members, everybody's listening live right now as a member. So, if um, if you had a chance to see, I've been I'm tr I, I I'm only doing live shows on Monday morning and Thursday evening now to kind of give me time to catch up on all the content. And what I started, what I tried to do was I tried to go in and re-edit some of the longer videos down to like five or ten minutes of the like a summation of the article. A lot of people have recommended that I do that to kind of get a little bit more of the YouTube audience. People don't want to sit and watch it for an hour. And I understand that. But in the process of editing it down, I did maybe one or two of them. And it takes me almost two hours to edit one down to like five or 10 minutes. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here for two hours editing down a, a paper to five or 10 minutes when I could just sit here and just do a summation, a one-off summation for five or 10 minutes and just post a brand new video. It'll be a summation. So if, you, if you're a member, which you are, if you're listening live right now, you've seen a couple of the video uh, summation videos go up. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do the long form podcast, which is what I'm doing right now. And then once it's, when it's over, I'll just quickly do like a five or 10 minute summation and record it and post it on live. That way there'll be a long form podcast and then there'll be a short summation video that'll only be on YouTube. I won't post it to podcast platforms. So if for some reason you're inclined to just get a five minute quick summary of the paper, that'll be loaded, you know, whatever, a week later, or I don't know, whenever I get, whenever I load it, but it'll be recorded immediately after the show. So it's all fresh in my mind. And then you can watch the short version. 
So I'll go back and redo all the previous papers. But I'm not going to edit those things down. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Two and a half hours on one article when I could just do it in five minutes on the summation live is, you know, that's that's the direction I'm going to go. So you've seen that if you've seen the videos going on on the members only video stream or video section of the of the channel. So look forward to that. <clears throat> I hope that's kind of fits some other people's interests. If you know, if you don't want to sit and just hang out and listen to the podcast and you want to just a quick summation, that's the direction I'm going. <clears throat> The next point is tomorrow night is the members only um, Zoom meeting for, I don't know, a month, or maybe we'll do one every two months. I'm not real sure. And I've posted the link in the community tab. It'll be tomorrow night at 9 p.m. It'll be on Zoom. So just go to the community tab and you'll find all the, the Zoom information. And what I'll do is I'll turn it on around nine a little bit before nine and as long as someone shows up I'll, I'll hang out and just have a conversation but if no one's on by nine fifteen, then i'll just turn it off and go to bed <laughs> so um it's just an opportunity it's not recorded or broadcast and i'm not i don't i'm not even coming with any content i might, I might just briefly discuss kind of what my thoughts are on the research and the, the revenue from the stream and kind of what i'm intending to use it for and things like that maybe tomorrow um, just if you want to come and just see what everybody else is doing right now, if they're putting out pre-emergence or what's working for them, or I don't know what direction it'll go, but it's just an opportunity if you'd like to have a conversation and like to have some, you know, fellowship with other turf grass professionals, that'd be an opportunity to do that. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have during the stream. I mean, I'll be, I mean, I'm not there just to sit in the background. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to participate in any way you want me to but it's i'm not coming with a lecture so i'm not looking to do more work <laughs> i'm looking to build a community <laughs> so that's that's kind of what the, the intent is there good morning james petty senior um so that's basically you know brings us up to speed i guess it's a beautiful day here in lexington it's going to kind of get worse the next day or two i know we're having some bad weather in the midwest and it's kind of headed this way a little bit so hopefully everybody stays well i know they're really making a big deal about the possible tornadoes and storms and things in oklahoma and kansas and missouri and so hopefully we don't have much damage anywhere and and um we'll look see what happens on tuesday wednesday and thursday of this week it's supposed to get pretty bad so we'll see if it gets all the way to lexington or not i don't know um, okay, so we're going over biostimulants this month, and there's been we're going to go over a couple papers that show basically nothing happens, and we'll go over a couple papers that show there's some positive responses. Okay, uh, so what I want to do first is I want to bring up the scoreboard. I have a scoreboard for biostimulants this this month as well, and on Thursday night we went over the Urban 2004 paper. And they used seaweed extract and humic acid in the field with creeping bent grass, and they didn't find that there was really any benefit to it. And today we're going to go over a paper that used seaweed extract as a biostimulant, and they were doing it. This study today is going to be on Bermuda grass, four Bermuda grass cultivars, in fact. And we're going to see where it falls, uh, whether it was a positive response, no response, or a negative response. So we'll keep track of the scoreboard as we go. I think I only have maybe six or eight papers for April now that I'm only doing two of them two a week um but just you know a spoiler alert is that it's gonna roughly be the same as the potassium except for well no that's not true not same as potassium it's, but it's gonna be there's not gonna be much negative effect it's just gonna be some of them are gonna show some positive effects most of them are gonna show no effect but the positive effect is not always going to be um, it's not going to be uniform. It's going to be more like during specific times. And it's not going to be a positive effect like on many of the metrics that we care about, like quality or color or growth or something like that. It's going to be some, usually some plant component that is intended to be associated with some metric that we care about, like stress, like heat stress or cold tolerance or something like that. But it doesn't always line up that this this number goes up and therefore it's more cold tolerant, which is actually what we're going to find today. 
Um, so just keep that in mind, you know, just because there's a, you know, oh, we apply biostimulants and this plant, you know, component or hormone went up. That's not necessarily a positive response in my mind. It, it's, a, it's a response, but to me, a positive response is a response about something we care about or is extremely closely related or correlated with something we care about. Like if you're going to increase roots, don't really care unless you can convince me that that increase also resulted in some other metric that my clientele cares about, like density or color or quality or growth or, you know, whatever the case is. Um, so that's what I mean when I say you, you got to be careful when you talk about like positive responses. You can have to make sure that you're talking about the same. It's some, talking about something that you care about. So transition zone guy 7B, will, you, will I post the full videos at a later time if members miss the live stream? Context is important for me. Oh yeah, for sure transition zone guy. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how it works with member streams clearly because I've worked for, honest to God, I worked for six hours this weekend trying to get the chat to work and I couldn't get it to work on the members only live stream. Can't get it to work. So I don't really know what I'm doing on the member stream. I finally got the YouTube stream, the normal stream, sort of figured out with the chat and the loading and things like that. So I got that sort of figured out. But now I'm switching to member stream. I thought it was going to be the same. And I, I get, apparently it's not. So the reason I'm telling you that transition zone guy is that normally when I end the stream, YouTube will just load immediately. So I can just log in. I mean, just go on YouTube and what I just broadcast is immediately on YouTube. But then it, as it's a members only stream today, I don't know how that works. I don't know if it's immediately available to all members or if it's just immediately available to just like everybody or if it's not available at all. I, I don't know what to expect. But my intent is to, yes, have it available to the public at some point a day or two later. And I'm hoping that it's available to the members immediately afterwards, but we'll see. As soon as I hang up, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll see if it loads. So um, I hate to plead ignorance so much, but that's just the reality. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I don't really know what to expect. I'm, I, I thought chat would work. I, I thought chat would be just fine, but it wasn't. So, um, you know, live and learn. Okay, so what I want to do is start, the, start this paper. Now, this paper is, it's a good paper, really good paper. It's just, it's not really easy for me to work my way through. So I'm going to do my best to kind of refine it down to the, to the topics that I think are of most interest. This paper has quite a bit to do with different Bermuda grass cultivars. The author of this paper is a friend of mine, and he's, he's interested in species and cultivars and testing different Bermuda grasses and fescues. And I mean, he's interested in a lot of those things in his career. And this paper is, shows that, but during this research, he actually looked at different, uh, a, a biostimulant in the fall too, as, as well. So, um, I'm not really good at all the different species and cultivars and differences and seeded and all the, you know, all these things. I'm not that good at that. Whereas he is, and you kind of see his interest in the paper. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm going to do my best to do the paper justice, but the plant part of it is not um, a biostimulant topic. It's more of a plant or Bermuda grass cultivar topic that, um, that is important, I think. So I'm going to show one, one graph with that and the rest of it's going to be on the biostimulant. Let's see if I can get this up. Okay. So the name or the title of this paper is the influence of late season iron, nitrogen, and seaweed extract on fall color retention and cold tolerance of four Bermuda grass cultivars by Dr. Munshaw, Irvin, Shane, Askew, Zhang, and Lemus, Lemus? I don't know, I don't know that last author. And um, as you all might know, Dr. Munshaw and I worked together for a couple years here at Kentucky before um, he moved on and then COVID hit and it's a long story, but they shut down the program here at University of Kentucky. So there's no longer any turf research here at Kentucky. But he and I were sort of the last, you know, the last, you know, champions of the turf grass program here before the powers that be chose that sit and decided that it was no longer of importance to them. So they shut it down. But 
Um, but this paper was published by Dr. Munshaw when he was, I guess this is his PhD work, I'm assuming, because it's rather, rather robust. And I, I'm assuming, I forget, I've read through this a couple of times. I guess they did it in Virginia. We'll find out as we read through it. Okay. But before we start, let me just briefly, basic, briefly explain for those people who are listening who might not, um, might not know what a biostimulant is. First of all, I'm not a plant physiologist, just to make it completely clear. And so when you start dealing with biostimulants, you start dealing with plant physiology, start dealing with plant chemistry and hormones and other components, amino acids and things like that in the plant that may, may impart some benefit to the plant beyond the nutritional component of the, of the additive or the biostimulant. So you're going to quickly see the limits of my knowledge on this issue on biostimulants, but we can find our, we can work our way through the, the, the article. But just understand, I might make a mistake, and it's it's I might make mistakes even in topics that I'm really good at. But I mean, mistakes happen when I'm live. But when I'm in topics like this, I got to be real careful because I'm not an expert in this, and so I'll do my best to address any questions. But to be frank, I, I probably won't answer it correctly, so I probably won't answer it all. Just defer it to a specialist. But biostimulants are think of biostimulants as a sin, it, this is a sort of a broad term. It's basically any sort of plant. Um, additive or com or I don't want to say a fertilizer, but plant um, product that can impart a beneficial response in a plant that is secondary or in addition to the nutrient component. So, like say, if you have a an amino acid type product and you apply it to a plant, the question is not whether or not you're going to see a beneficial response because you're adding a product that has nitrogen. Amino acids have nitrogen in them, right? The question is whether or not you would see a benefit above the that which would, would would occur from the nitrogen that's already in the product so if you're applying a tenth of a pound of nitrogen in the form of, of an amino acid then you would have to apply a tenth of a pound of nitrogen from a mineral source like or a nutrient source like urea or ammonium sulfate or something else and then compare those two and then if there's any additional benefit that you would see you would have to see it compared to the same amount of nitrogen that was applied from a non-amino acid source and the same thing would go for phosphorus or iron or anything else that's in those uh, biostimulants. So, and, and there can be benefits. I'm going to go through that. There can be some benefits, but it's not revolutionary, okay? <laughs> it's not going to change the world. And, and beyond that, or in addition to that, the response that you receive from a biostimulant, let's say you see the increase go up. Let, let's say you apply a, a half pound of N from urea and you apply... Uh, uh, the equivalent amount of nitrogen, but part of that nitrogen is applied in the form of a biostimulant that has an amino acid in it. And let's say you see a, a greater response from the biostimulant product, right? Let's say, I don't know, pick a number. You got 10% increase or 20% increase in color or whatever the case is. That may, that may occur during certain times of the year, during certain stresses. But my question is, whatever response you saw beneficial response you saw let's say you saw a 20 percent increase in quality well what did that cost you because you replaced nitrogen with an, with a much more expensive form of some biostimulant okay can you just apply a little bit more nitrogen that costs less and get the equivalent response that you got from the amino acid in other words you know how efficient is the money that you're spending on that that's that's another question that needs to be addressed or needs to be considered when you're considering biostimulants because there can be a benefit. How much does it cost versus how much does it cost for me to get the same benefit from another source? Oftentimes, that's not even considered in the scientific literature, but it's something you need to consider in practice. Okay. Oh, we saw increase in root growth of 50%. Okay. How much did it cost? <laughs> and then can you get the same response from some other product that costs less? Okay. That's, that's where I think there's a gap in between science and practitioners where there's not a lot of research done in that gap. Anyway, here we go. We're going to start. Okay, the influence of late season nitro iron, nitrogen, and seaweed extract on fall color retention and cold tolerance of four Bermuda grass cultivars. Common and hybrid Bermuda grass are frequently used in the transition zone where they can provide an excellent surface for golf course fairways and athletic fields. These species, however, have a 
great tendency to be injured or killed by winter temperatures in the transition zone. And so, and that's the case with pretty much any Bermuda grass, even some of the newer cultivars, right, from Oklahoma State or wherever they're generated. There's a bunch of different Bermuda grasses that are coming out that are much more cold tolerant. But if the conditions are hard enough, it's going to kill those too. It just won't kill them as readily as some of the, the other cultivars, right? So like your latitude 36s and your Tahomas and things like that. At least it seems to me that the, there's a lot of practical anecdotal information that, as well as scientific information that seems to me that the, those Bermuda grass cultivars in the transition zone, in, in the transition zone um, tend, to, tend to survive better than some of the other cultivars of Bermuda grass. Where it gets cold, it gets really, really cold, they tend to survive a little bit better. And, um, but if it gets cold enough, it'll kill those too. Okay, it's not, not that they're bulletproof, but you know, we're trying to grow Bermuda grass in transition zones. Um, it can be challenging, and his point is they have a ten- these Bermuda grasses have a tendency to be injured or killed by winter d- temperatures. Although there are conflicting reports regarding the effect of fall fertilization on Bermuda grass, recent research suggests that early reports of negative effects of late season nitrogen on Bermuda grass cold tolerance may not be accurate. Okay, and he has a couple citations for that. So he's talking about late season nitrogen applications. And he talks about some things that resulted in beneficial responses and some didn't. And he goes on to iron. Iron may be another nutri- nutrient that prolongs fall color without negatively affecting cold tolerance. Tests have shown that iron applications in conjunction with moderate summer nitrogen applications, so a half a pound of nitrogen per month, can improve the performance of Bermuda grass during the fall and improve recovery in the spring. And that's the White Schmidt 1990 study. Okay, so he's saying that you could apply night. Basically, the study is trying to figure out how can you uh, prolong the color or what happens to spring green up. This whole study is going to look at that. And he's talking about maybe late season nitrogen can do that. Maybe adding a little bit of color from iron can do that. And he's providing a little bit of, you know, introduction as to the, into those topics. In certain natural products such as seaweed, this is Ascophyllum nodosum, the seaweed extract contain high levels of cytokinins and auxins as well as moderate levels of other hormones. The, uh, I can't pronounce this, but this study stated that if the efficacy of these products appeared to be due mainly to cytokinins, that may also have been due to trace nutrients found in the product. And that's what I was trying to explain earlier, is that you'll see a lot of uh, marketing on cytokinins and gibberellic acids and um, amino acids and a lot of stuff. And there is, there's the, 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 the confusing thing is, is that there can there is some evidence to support some of that. If you've ever in undergraduate work, if you've ever done any work with um, or, ornamental plants or or floriculture, or you can you can um, cut off certain parts of the plant and replace that was that was cut off. Let's say you cut off a part of the plant that was providing a hormone, and you replace that with an auger or, or a gel that contained that hormone. The plant can be tricked into thinking that it was never cut off and to continue to grow. And you can fidget with plants like that. You can add on cytokinins or gibberellic acid, or you can remove those and see how the plant responds. That's very common in undergraduate floriculture. And so those hormones can have a great effect on plant growth is where I'm going with that. Um, but the, he says here is that it may also have been due to trace nutrients found in the products. In other words, when those amino acids are applied or hormones are applied to the surface before they enter the plant, or if they enter the plant, they, they're subjected to mineralization just like any other compound outside the plant. Microbes will break that stuff down pretty quick. And so the, the question is, is the response from the actual hormone or from the, I should, it's not all hormones, but uh, from the biostimulant, or is it from the nutrients in the biostimulant that just got broke down and taken up? And there's a very, um, I'll go into it one, one second. There's a very, it's a horrible, horrible paper that I'll go into this month that was published in an awful journal <laughs> that attempts to convince people that um, the application of amino acids is, is actually taken up as amino acids and converted, or not converted, and taken up right into the stream of the plant, and therefore there's some energy savings. And that, that, that all may be true. I'm not saying it's, it's false, okay? But what I'm saying is the paper is written by uh, a the owner of a company that sells these products 
or it was funded and he's an author on the paper and it was it's just awful it's awful <laughs> it's it's a horrible <coughs> it's a horrible paper and but the reason that paper was written was because there was some discussion as to whether or not what he's saying is true it's like you can't say certain things because you don't know whether or not it was actually taken up and used because there's not been any work done and so they did this really lame study and it's hor- it's not even hardly refereed it's it's awful but the, they were attempting to um, you know, work around this issue of, of the trace nutrients in the product actually may be causing the response and not the actual product itself. And that, again, that may be true, but his, that paper has not convincing evidence at all. But I'm going to use that paper as an example of, you know, a, l- a little bit more advanced critical thinking skills through scientific literature. If you don't know the journal's awful, you don't really know, then your you, your guard's not up. And if you don't if you don't know how to read through the paper critically and understand what should and shouldn't be in there, then you just read it and assume that it's true, right? Um, so I'm going to use that paper later in the month. Look forward to that. I might do it on a Thursday night when there's the most audience watching. <laughs> we'll see what happens with that. A recent study by Zhang and Irvin, and I'll go over this paper too. Oh, well, this might have been the this might have been the paper there that I just already went over, but they did Jang and Urban did a lot of papers on this in the early 2000s. Anyway, their paper with creeping bentgrass also indicated that beneficial effects of seaweed, ex- seaweed extract applications, such as increased levels of antioxidants and photochemical efficiency during drought, may be due to increased en- en- endo- endogenous levels of cytokines. Yeah, that's that's I think that's the one we already went over. We didn't really see much benefit there. They did show some increase in some products or the components in the plant, but there wasn't any real benefit they stated at the end of that of that paper i think that's the paper we went over cytokinins can act to inhibit i'm going to read through this a little bit because some people might not know exactly what cytokinins actually do and um they do a little bit they do a good job of kind of just briefly explaining what it is that the cytokinins in these products can do cytokinins can act to inhibit senescence in leaves by counteracting the effects of ethylene or abscisic acid Cytokinins may also maintain membrane integrity by reducing lipase or lipase and lipo, lipozygenase activity processes involved in membrane breakdown. Okay. So he kind of gives a good ex- brief, as brief as you can make it, the benefit of, or what cytokinins can do in terms of re- resulting in a benefit to the plant. Okay. He goes on here. You can read. Uh, a lot more information about how what his, his take on it is and the literature on cytokinins. He has a couple paragraphs on that. I'm not going to read through that. He talks about the membrane becoming less fluid or gel-like and all these other things. Okay. During cold stress, plant accumulate plants accumulate sucrose and other simple sugars as well as proline. And I'm also going to talk about proline here because they actually measure proline. But I'm going to read this. Don't get lost in it too much. But I want to make sure we set the stage as to why I'm going to show data on proline. Okay, other simple sugars, as well as proline and glycine, glycine betaine or betaine, which have been reported to help stabilize membranes and act as osmolites that maintain water balance within the cell. Proline may have many functions in stress tolerance, including osmotic adjustment, protein and membrane stabilization, gene induction, reactive oxygen species scavenging, nitrogen and carbon source, and a reduction, a reduction equivalent source during stress, stress recovery. So that's what proline sort of is, uh, may, may provide in the plant. And you'll see that's why, and that's why he's going to measure it. Proline levels have been shown to increase during cold acclimation, decrease during deacclimation, and increase to a greater extent in cold, hardy species. As extracellular ice crystals form, water moves from inside the cell to enlarge these extracellular ice crystals. By increasing solute concentration, cell osmotic potential is decreased, making water movement out of the cell less likely. This reduction would prevent the enlargement of ice crystals and maintain cell hydration. Okay, so that's, again, a brief explanation of proline and what function it serves and provides justification as to why you measured it. The objectives of this study were to determine the effects of late season nitrogen, iron, and seaweed extract applications on Bermuda grass fall visual quality, spring green up, lipid saturation, and proline concentration, and to determine if these treatments were associated with changes in freeze tolerance, and to determine 
bio, biochemical and cold tolerance differences in four Bermuda grass cultivars. So when, when I'm looking at this, late season nitrogen, iron, and seaweed applica applications on Bermuda grass, visual quality, spring green up. That's what we care about. And then the lipid saturation, the proline concentration are an, uh, uh, the scientists attempt to ex uh, potentially explain anything they see in the prior two. So visual quality and spring, spring green up may occur. Why did it occur? They can actually, the lipid saturation and proline concentration may provide greater information as to why that might have occurred. I don't personally care about, and I don't think the authors personally care about the lipid and proline concentrations per se. No one, no turf person is going to care about that. But if it, it might provide an explanation as to why they saw what they saw in visual quality or spring green up, I think that's why they did that. But the authors are, could correct me if I'm wrong. A field study was conducted at Virginia Tech, and so it's, we're in Blacksburg, Virginia. Plots were established on a silt loam with a pH of 6.8 and a potassium level of 59 parts per million. Plots, plots were established on 20th of June in 2001 using four Bermuda grass cultivars. So for those people who are interested in different Bermuda grass cultivars, this was before the days of Tahoma and Latitude and some of these newer varieties and of Bermuda grass were really on the market. Okay, and the, these they're going to use some um some seeded uh, at least one seeded cultivar and then the other ones are propagated i believe so the bermuda grass cultivars were tiffway mid iron princess 77 and riviera and then princess 77 seed was supplied by this person and then riviera seed was supplied by tyler farrow who was the the uh, breeder at oklahoma state for ages and ages mid iron and tiffway sprigs were supplied by virginia tech turfgrass research center so they just got the sprigs off the location so they had two that were seeded and two that were sprigged Nitrogen was applied in the form of ammonium nitrate once monthly at a rate of one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, beginning in, at establishment and ending on the 15th of August. A complete fertilizer was applied the following spring at a rate of one pound per thousand, and monthly nitrogen applications from ammonium nitrate began again on June 15th of 2002. Irrigation was supplied as needed to prevent visual moisture stress. And I've mentioned this, I don't know how many times, but... Time after time after time in literature, we see that sentence. Many of my papers have it, unless you're looking at water stress. Many of many papers have it in there. The irrigation was, was supplied as needed to prevent moisture stress. Okay, and I've mentioned why why they why we do that, and that the reason is because we know water is very influential. Okay. And we don't want it to be the influencing factor in our study. We don't want it to alter the results from the, from the treatment effect. And if we're constantly applying water, which is what a lot of homeowners do, and a lot of, a lot of turf managers do, they apply too much water, it can alter the effect of the treatment. Or if we don't apply enough water and go into drought conditions, that can alter the effect of the treatment. So that's, again, one reason why water is at the, the foundation of the risk factor pyramid. It's critical to have your finger on the water okay <laughs> so it, it, we, he just puts this in this is not a water study he just puts this in there they applied water when you see a little bit of moisture stress they applied water no problem it's in almost every turf grass study unless you're doing water work and you want it to go down or you want it to go up um, so keep that in mind i mean we're talking about biostimulants here but even in the biostimulant paper water is important and they say that okay after bermuda grass establishment three chemical treatments were applied during the summer to autumn period uh, summer to autumn period leading to bermuda grass shoots in essence and non-treated control is also included within each bermuda grass cultivar despite my best, best efforts i haven't been able to see what the seaweed extract was then they, they're supposed to put in like where they got it from and it's probably in here i'm just missing it but i can't seem to find what the seaweed extract form was or manufacturer was but I'll read through it. Fall chemical treatments began on August 15th of 2001 and 2002 and continued on a three-week schedule until apparent dormancy. 80 to 100% of canopy was browning. That's how they define dor apparent dormancy. Final chemical treatment dates were October 17th in 2001 and October 31st in 2002. Seaweed extract was applied at a rate of 0.54 kilograms per hectare. And I don't know what form that, I don't know what company provided it. They don't say, but... Nitrogen was applied at one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, and iron was applied at one kilogram of, per hectare of, as iron sulfate. And they applied to the to as, as foliars or as a liquid. 
Okay. And they go through the stats, the stats and the chemical, the experimental design, all that stuff. I watch what I won't go into, but you have, you feel free to pause it and you can read through that. Fall quality and spring visual quality was on one to nine. They don't say the minimum. So I don't know if it was five or six, how they did the minimum in the study, but it was one to nine, one being brown or dead and nine being perfect, perfect or flawless turf. As plots were well established by late autumn, color was primarily, was the primary parameter of interest during quality ratings. Spring greenup was visually estimated as the percentage of greenup, of green ground cover present. Okay. They did a controlled freezing study. I don't know if I'm going to go into that or not. I don't even discuss it, but they have the materials and methods. The total lipid extraction and fatty acid quantification, I'm not going to read in how they did that. HPLC procedures, which is high performance local um, chromatog chromatography, I'm not going to read that. <laughs> but if you want to know all how they did all that stuff, feel free to read in there. The proline term determination, I'm not going to read how they did that. But just understand they they measured that proline, they measured um, some products through HPLC, the lipid extraction, the fatty acid quantification, and the controlled freezing. They have all the explanation there, okay? So the results I'm going to show in PowerPoint, but I want to point out that as he says here, the very first sentence says, year was not significant and data were pulled across years. So what that means is, is one, they, they probably... Well, they uh, they either performed it very very well or they just they just got lucky because a lot of times the the different there will be differences among years right and when there are differences among years then you need to leave them separate because what happened in one year didn't happen in the other year but in this case the, what happened in both years was the same there was no there was no significance of the year effect and so when you when that happens it's a good thing and that means that you can merge the years together instead of saying this happened in 2001 and this was different in 2002. They, they don't need to say that. They can merge them together and the power of the study is doubled. And so your ability to determine differences between treatments is also stronger, is also doubled. Okay. So I want to point that out because you're going to see the data presented and the reason they presented it, they didn't show one year and then the next year the reason was, was because there was no significant effect of year. Now let me go to the PowerPoint. Now, so the, the PowerPoint, I'm not going to show every data. I'm only going to show the data that I think are sort of interesting to the audience here today that will maybe useful to you in some pra practical way. Um, but understand there's more data in the paper if you want to go read all that. It's in the paper. Bermuda grass quality pooled across treatments in years. So we're going to look at the effect of the Bermuda grass cultivars as we go into the from from August into November. So this so the in other words the all the treatments are going to be pulled together and the years are going to be pulled together. So this is just mid iron versus Riviera versus Tiffway versus Princess 77 in August, September, October and November on a quality scale from 1 to 9. Good morning, Randy. Uh so that's what we're looking at on the screen for those listening. So we're August, September, October, November is on the x-axis and turf quality is on the y-axis. And we see in August that Riviera, the, um, the red, the, so I'll have these labeled according to the stats that were on the paper. And Riviera had the highest quality of like around a little over eight. And that was equivalent to Tiffway. And then we go down to Mid-Iron, but they're all eight or above. They're all very good. So Mid-Iron, Riviera, and Tiffway were all eight or greater. This, to me, and if Dr. Munchall was here, he might have a different opinion, but to me, you're looking at a 7.8 or 7.9 compared, which is different compared to a one point or an 8.1 or 8.2. Practically speaking, you're probably not ever going to be able to see that. They're all very good is the point. Mid-Iron, Riviera, and Tiffway, even though there was a little bit of difference between Mid-Iron and, uh, Mid and Riviera, Riviera was a little better quality. But look at Princess 77. We're down in the mid sixes. Probably acceptable. I don't know what the acceptable limit is, but if six was acceptable, it was acceptable. But it's much lower than the other three cultivars of Bermuda grass. Same species, different cultivars. Now look at September. As we move into the fall, the Mid Iron Riviera and Tiffway were all equivalent, They're all around seven and a half or so. And the Princess 77 remained around six and a half. So we're looking at a full point difference. You would notice that in the field. I'm not a real big Princess Bermuda fan, to be honest. I know there's probably value in it somewhere, but it just seems to always sort of lag behind the other cultivars. 
September and October. As we go to October, it's just more or less the same thing. All the, now, keep in mind we're going into the fall, so the quality is going down as a result of either temperature or light or both. And we see all the temperature, all, all the qualities declining of all these grass, all these turf grasses. But still, in general, the Mid Iron, Riviera, and Tifway are all greater than the Princess seventy seven. But they're all down now, now near the sixes at, in October. And in November, it kind of flips. In November, the Princess 77 did stay a little higher, but it's still four. All of them are unacceptable, but Princess 77 was around four, and the other uh, mid iron Riviera and Tifway were around three and a half or so. And that, they were statistically significant. I don't know if you'd see that with the eye. Maybe. Probably not. Uh, I mean, they're all unacceptable anyway. So they're below four at this point in November as a result of going into dormancy. So what this says is, is that there is a difference in cultivars, you know, genetics matter. And what, I think the second author I ever had on was Ross Braun. I, th I think it was that paper that we went over, pretty sure, where at the end of that conversation we had, the sort of the summation was genetics matter. Okay. You know, that it makes a big difference, not just the species, but within cultivars, they matter. All right, and then not to go too far down soil testing and nutrients and so forth, but nutrient needs, soil testing recommendations very likely differ even within species. Okay, so genetics matter. You know, if you're if you're looking to um, maximize the quality or the potential of your of your you know football field or your fairway or whatever you know your lawn. If you're looking to, looking to maximize, maximize it, and let's say you do achieve maximization of it, let's say you do achieve its potential, its greatest potential, but that potential is still not acceptable to your clientele, then you got to change grasses. Genetics do matter. Okay, there's only so much you're going to get out of a certain cultivar, and it, it, let's let's take um, well, let's just take one of these, like Riviera, for example. And no, let's take Princess. So Princess seventy seven, there's maybe a spot for it, but in Blacksburg, Virginia. You're only going to get about a six or maybe seven or something out of this particular cultivar relative to the other one. So if a six is not acceptable to you from Princess, this right here will tell you, let me put it back on the screen here. This right here says you're only going to get about a six, six and a half out of that in August. And if that's the maximum you're going to get, if you're happy with it, then fine. If you're not, then you got to change cultivars. Okay. That's what's going to get you from a six to an eight in this particular example. Okay, let me put that on there. Okay, so that's what I'm getting at. The genetics do matter. And I think that's what Dr. Munshaw would, would agree with. Now let's go to the actual biostimulant data. So now we're looking at Bermuda grass quality pulled across cultivars in years. So the previous one was pulled across treatments. This one's pulled across cultivars. And now we're going to look at the effect of these of nitrogen seaweed extract iron compared to non-treated turf. In August, September, October, and November. So as we're going in the dormancy, we're looking at turf quality. So in, whoops, in, how did I do that? I messed up. What did I do? Let me get back here. Hang on. Okay. So we're looking at August turf quality. And we see that all of them were the same. Nitrogen, seaweed extract, iron, and the non-treated turf. All of them were around a little bit less than eight on the quality scale in August. Okay, this is when they sort of just started the treatments in August. There's no differences. When we move to September, the nitrogen was around seven and a half, and all the rest of them were around seven point three or something. There was a statistically there was a reduction in quality with seaweed extract, iron, and the non-treated compared to nitrogen. Other, well, I should say it the other way around. Statistically, there was an increase in quality using nitrogen, um, but there was no difference between the seaweed extract, the iron, and the non-treated turf grass. I, this is not biologically significant. They're all you're not going to see that with the eye, but they pulled out statistically in September, but the, the biostimulant had no beneficial effect in September on turf quality. When you go into October, the, the treatments were statistically all the same. They, all the plots were declining. Now we're down in the sixes. The nitrogen was probably a little bit better, but statistically they were all the same. Probably biologically, you'd never see that, but there was certainly no difference between non-treated turf grass and biostimulant, the seaweed extract, which is why we're here today talking about biostimulants. The, the addition of seaweed extract in October, August, September, October, resulted in no 
benefit in turf quality compared to non-treated turf grass. And in November, we saw a very, very slight increase with nitrogen and iron, but no additional benefit from applying seaweed extract. This is sort of like the overarching data set of the whole study. Okay. So in this particular study in the field on Bermuda grass, four different Bermuda grass cultivars going from August into November. So from full blown growth into dormancy or close to dormancy, the addition of seaweed extract did not show any um, benefit. The nitrogen was the primary beneficial agent with a little bit of iron helped a little bit in November, but primarily it was from nitrogen. Now we go to the chemical treatments effect on post freeze regrowth of Bermuda grass cultivars in the winter of 2002. So now we're looking at regrowth percentage and we're going to look within cultivars. So we're going to look just what happened in mid iron. Okay. So in mid iron, you see the control was about a 60% regrowth and that was the same as nitrogen and seaweed extract. So all of these were statistically the same. The uh, a reduction in regrowth occurred from the application of iron to mid iron. Okay. So uh, the application of iron in terms of its ability to enhance chemical, uh, hence post-freeze regrowth, it actually reduced regrowth down to about 40% from 60% from the non-treated turf grass and mid iron in mid iron Bermuda in Riviera that did not happen. It was, it was different. So the non-treated turf grass, resulted in the same amount of regrowth as did the iron, as did the nitrogen, but it was, oh, e even the seaweed extract. These were all statistically the same. It varied from about 30% to 50% regrowth, but statistically they were all the same. There was no difference among treatments in, in Riviera. There was also no difference in Tifway. The regrowth percentage was around 20 to 25% in Tifway Bermuda grass. And in Princess 77, there were no differences as well. So in, 2000, in the winter of 2002, the addition of seaweed extract did not enhance the post-freeze regrowth of Bermuda grass cultivars. We go to the next year, so the winter of 2003, exact same setup, mid-iron, Riviera, Tifway, Princess 77, nitrogen, seaweed extract, iron, and non-treated turf grass on regrowth. And we see with mid-iron, there was no difference in the treatments, had no, no effect on, on post-freeze regrowth in mid, with mid-iron. There was no statistical difference in Riviera, so Nothing happened with Riviera. With Tifway, there was no difference between the seaweed extract and the non-treated turf grass. But the iron again reduced the post-freeze regrowth. This time it was in Tifway compared to non-treated turf grass. We're looking at about 20 or 30% regrowth, and there was no benefit to applying biostimulants in this case. In Princess 77, there was again no benefit to applying biostimulants in the winter of 2003 regarding post-freeze regrowth. On sea with seaweed extract. So for winter of 2002 and winter of 2003, post-freeze regrowth was not beneficially influenced by seaweed extract. When we go to the post-freeze regrowth of, two, of the summer of 2003 now, same exact setup, but now we're in the summer of 2003. No differences in mid-iron. We're at about 15 to 20% regrowth. No differences among nitrogen seaweed extract and non-treated turf. Or you could just not apply to anything and been the same as applying nitrogen or, or seaweed extract. Riviera, there was greater regrowth, but again, no differences among treatments. Tifway, we, oh, this should be a B. There was a little bit of a benefit from applying nitrogen. And in this case, this was the only case where this, this letter here for non-treated should be a B. I'm sorry, this is, this is not right. This should be a B right there. So in this case, Tifway in the summer 2003, nitrogen and seaweed extract both resulted in a little bit more regrowth, post-freeze regrowth than did non-treated turf. But this is what I'm saying. If you're just going to apply nitrogen and you're going to get the same regrowth as you did with seaweed extract, unless you're somehow restricted to apply nitrogen, then applying seaweed extract is going to cost you more money. You got the same regrowth response from just applying nitrogen. So as long as you can apply nitrogen, I don't see the benefit in applying seaweed extract so long as it's, it, it costs the same or more than nitrogen, which is almost certainly the case that the seaweed extract is going to cost you more money. So again, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I'm buying into that right now. And then in Princess 77, there was no differences in the summer 2003 between non-treated turf grass and seaweed extract. Okay. Oh, good morning, Grass Factor. 
Uh, sorry, for those of you who just joined us, I can't get the chat. And oh, by the way, while you're on, Matt, can you have your IT guy send me an email back? Okay. I can't, I'm having problems with chat. I, I rarely ask for help. Okay. I'm asking for help. I need help figuring out how to get my chat to show up on a members only stream. Can someone please help me with that? It is very frustrating. I don't know what I'm doing and I can't get the chat to show up on screen. Only on the members only stream. Okay, now we go to the effect of chemical treatments on Bermuda grass green up. So now again, what I'm what I'm showing is the post freeze regrowth, the green greening going into dormancy, and now we're looking at the chemical treatments of Bermuda grass green up. These are all things we care about. Okay, there's other things in this paper that are a little bit more detailed and a little bit more scientific that I'm not convinced the audience would generally you know warm up to. It's a little bit more complicated, but there's no but. I mean, it's a good paper. It's just that I'm just showing the, the data that I think would be of most interest to you all because it's very, very useful, very practical. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, and Western Mass Turf. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's who I'm. Yeah. <laughs> I need Jay Pink to swoop in and, and save the day. That's what I need. It's, 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 it's the same thing as like, um, I don't know how it sounds or what, 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 I don't really want to go too far down that road, but it's very liberating and, and relaxing to simply say you don't know how to do this because other people, I guarantee you, do know how to do it, okay? And they probably go, well, yeah, why didn't you just call me? I could have fixed that in 30 seconds, you know? And so I've learned that over my life. Just, if you don't know, don't fake it. Just say, you know what? I need help. I don't know. And someone, someone, someone knows, I guarantee you. And it's the same thing with, with what I do and what you all do, like the homeowners don't know and they ask you a question and you're like, well, you won't say this to them, but you're thinking to yourself, well, that's the easiest thing in the world. Well, I mean, that's, that's what you do for a living, you know? So it's the same thing. And then that's just something I'm just not good at. Oh, okay. His family's leaving town, so I'm sure he wants a decompression distraction. Yeah, all, all I need is just like, hey, just use this software program or whatever, he, whatever you do. I don't know what you do. I just wanted to show up on members only. That's all I want to do. I don't know why it was. It seemed to be very difficult. I don't know why. Again, I'm probably making it more difficult than it should be. All right. Let's get to the chem the effects of chemical treatments on Bermuda green up. Nitrogen, seaweed extract, iron, and non-treated turf grass. So this is, again, I think this is going to be pulled across uh, cultivars. We're looking at green up from 0 to 100%. We're going to look at April, May, and June on the x-axis. Yeah, Western. Yeah, it's okay to find who instead of the how. Yeah, that's that's. I was I was uh, I was having my neighbor is a professor at another university, and he and I have a conversation every now and then, and and he he's very much the same way I am. He's like, well, if I don't know, that's fine. But I know I know who knows. That's what's important. <laughs> I can find out who knows. And the same thing with me. It's like I'm not a plant physiologist, but I know one who's good. I'm not a plant. I'm not a soil ne nematologist, but I know a really good one. You know. So just you know, stay in your lane, you know, <laughs> but don't be afraid to ask another car to come over and help you in your lane a little bit every now and then. That's sort of my approach nowadays. All right, let's get to it. Effective chemical treatments on Bermuda grass green up. In April of tw uh, April 28th, we see that the inclusion of the seaweed extract had no, resulted in no benefit in terms of spring green up compared to non-treated turf. But look, neither did either nitrogen or, or iron. So nothing helped the, tre the treatments, nothing in, uh, increased spring green up compared to non-treated turf in April. When we go to May, again, nothing helped. So the nitrogen that we bought, the seaweed extract that we bought, and the iron that we bought, and that we paid someone to go out and spray on these four Bermuda grass cultivars in Virginia, didn't result in any additional green up compared to not doing anything. Now again, we have to remember, they were applying nitrogen. It's not, it's not like the plots were void of nitrogen. Okay, they were applying nutrients. Okay, normal sort of management practices, but these were sort of in addition to that as a means to enhance the green up, right? And in June 1st, we saw that the, the crazy thing is in June 1st, the non-treated turf, I actually looked at this like four or five times. I'm like, okay, I want to make sure I'm not putting this on backwards, but the non-treated turf grass actually resulted in greater spring green up than even than the nitrogen treated. Now we're looking at difference between like 85 and 90%. So you probably wouldn't see it. Practically, you're not going to see that. 
you're not going to get any phone calls on that probably at all. Um, but the non-treated turf was resulted in greater spring greenup. So again, I've been reading these papers for 20 years. Okay. And my opinion, oftentimes I can be wrong, but my opinion is based as best I can on the evidence and the evidence that I'm aware of then. And it's, it goes f- for many, many papers. And this is an example of why I've said many times, I'm not in favor of applying anything or doing anything unless I have a good reason, unless I have some evidence to support it, because many times we find that the application or the engagement in some management practice might actually result in the opposite effect of what we're looking for. I showed you many examples of that with potassium, right? And here's one, albeit probably not practically significant, and it was just a one-off. Here's one where nitrogen actually resulted in a little bit of reduction in green up than did just doing nothing at all. Okay. Well, okay. Hang on. We were, they were remember they were still applying nutrient programs even to the non tree. They're still applying tree, but the not when we were looking at this, we're looking at the addition of iron to the program, the addition of seaweed extract to the program, and so forth. Okay. Make sure we're clear. Yeah, Randy, I, I have a number of authors who are on the list. <laughs> And uh, Dr. McGraw is, is one at the very, very top. I have an author coming on at the end of this month to go over biostimulants. And I have an author coming on in June to go over some, some turf grass uh, system strategies. But I don't really feel comfortable saying who it is because their, their schedules can change. And if they can't come on, it might look bad on them when in fact, it's just their schedule. They can't always make my little silly little show, you know? So, um, I don't want to mention it until I'm like, they're here and they're on screen because all sorts of weird things can happen. And I don't want it to reflect poorly upon them just because they, something happened out of their control. So that was in 2002 on, on Bermuda grass green up. Now let's go to 2003, same exact setup, April, May, and June. Nitrogen seaweed extract, iron, and non-treated. In April, we saw no benefit of the seaweed extract in terms of spring green up. In May, we saw no benefit of seaweed extract in terms of spring green up compared to non-treated turf grass. And in June, we saw no benefit of seaweed extract compared to non-treated turf grass. So in this case, and we didn't see any benefit to applying iron either, or even more nitrogen. We didn't see any more benefits. So it was, there was really no additional value to doing more to the turf, right? We go back to me. That was it on this on the slideshow. So um, I'm going to take that off if I can. So now we're going to go back to the paper and wrap this whole thing up. There's a couple things I do want to read in the paper. The this is where I pull all the data from. These tables you'll see on the screen. There's um, the, all the data that I pulled are just drew straight from these tables, and the statistics are the same. So I want to read just a couple things that I highlighted. Seaweed extract applications did not have any effect on Bermuda grass color retention as quality ratings were very similar to the control in both years of the study. <laughs> okay, so that's what happened on that. I'm not going to read the control freezing study information, but you're welcome to um, read through that. That was the post-growth, re- post-freeze regrowth data that I showed. Um, then I'm going to scroll through all this. Now the proline, I didn't go in. You now I was going to show that on the graph. I forgot to put it in there. Uh, let me show. Let me see if I can. Where is it? Thought there was a proline graph in here somewhere. Linoleic acid, proline concentrations. I didn't. I, I, I guess I messed up. I, I was going to show this table of proline concentration. There is a difference occasionally i'll just read it right here there is a difference occasionally in the proline concentration remember the proline remember we described it at the beginning that's the reason i went through it at the beginning because there can be uh this so they they were going to measure proline and proline ha- could have a beneficial influence on the plant growth and they they measured it here and i'll just go through it here on the table and, and it's and it's cultivar specific but notice in the fall of 2001, Riviera, Tifway, and Princess had no, we're going, to read it, we're going to read through it this way from left to right. There was no difference in those at all between the, pro, the proline concentration between non-treated turf and nitrogen seaweed extract or iron-treated turf. And in winter 2002, there was no differences between Riviera, Tifway, and Princess. Within those, there was no differences among, between treatments within those cultivars. 
In fall 2002, there were no differences at all. Uh, nitrogen seaweed extract iron had the same amount of proline as did non-treated turf grass. I'm going to get back to the ones that are different. Just hold on, hold on, guys. And then the winter 2003, there was no differences within Tifway and Princess um, 77. And in the summer 2003, there was no differences at all. Now, in the fall 2001 mid-iron, there was an increase. You can see right here the non-treated turf grass had a 693 level of micrograms per gram of proline, whereas the seaweed treated had 1,438, so we're more than doubling the amount of proline using seaweed extract in mid-iron in 2001, okay? But notice, iron did the same thing. And iron didn't have that much of an effect at all. And neither did seaweed extract in terms of quality or, or color into the fall or spring green up or post-freeze regrowth. They didn't have any effect. But in the plant, they're showing an increase in the proline. And the same thing happened in mid-iron in 2002, uh, where, not, not with seaweed extract, but with iron. Okay, so the seaweed extract was 400, non-treated was 167, and that's not statistically different, but with iron it was 1500 compared to 167. So we're seeing an increase in proline, but we're not seeing that result in a concomitant benefit in terms of something we care about. Okay, and same thing happens down here in, in winter of 2003 with Mid-Iron Riviera. There was an increase, I'm sorry, there was a decrease in proline following the application of some of these elements. And there was an increase in Riviera with nitrogen compared to non-treated turf grass in the winter of 2003. I, that's a really long, complicated way of saying occasionally there was an increase in proline with following the application of, a, of seaweed extract. Occasionally there wasn't, but it never really correlated with something, some desired turf grass response. And the reason I mentioned that, the reason I'm kind of talking about it a little bit here is because many papers will show, a, show just that. They'll show just some hormone or a constituent of the plant that is intended to be associated with some desired outcome. And they'll show that effect be benef beneficial, show it increase following the application of seaweed extract, right? Or humic acid or some other biostimulant. They'll say, okay, we well, applied this and this element in the plant went up. And as I've said before, that's all good when we're trying to explain results, but not, in my opinion, good as the result. Why? Because I don't, my clientele doesn't care about that result. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe y'all's clientele do care about that result. But I, I don't know. I probably don't know. 40 people in the world that even know what proline even does in the turf grass, much less turf, you know, clientele. They don't know what that does. So is it's useful to explain our results to help understand the system better. I'm with you there hundred percent, right? But not as a means to convince someone to buy it, to apply it there for that. I need something I care about and you, you can go down the list, quality, color, density, uh, you know, spring green up, fall color retention. There's all sorts of things that we care about, but I need to see enough evidence to convince me that, that, that it's going to benefit that. And I don't see it here. Okay. In the present study, proline concentration was not consistently or significantly affected by iron, seaweed extract, or nitrogen. It says it real simple in the text. I'm going to go down here. We're almost to the end. Chemical treatment did not affect green up of Mid-Iron, Riviera, or and Tifway, data not shown. Princess 77 control plots had greater amounts of green up than nitrogen treated plots at one date, which is what I showed. These data suggest that green up in general is also genetically controlled. Cultivars better able to prepare for winter than others by increasing lipid unsaturation and or proline concentration are the cultivars that will begin green up earlier in the spring and are less affected by winter. And I wish I had Dr. Munshaw on here. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Because he would be much better, much better suited to explain this than I am. But that's a really, it's a really good paragraph. I mean, what he's saying is genetics matter. Can there be some sort of benefit or slight bending of the numbers here or there to your favor? Occasionally, yes, probably, probably yes. But not genetic, not compared to genetics. You know, if you go up the pyramid, not compared to water, not compared to light, not compared to temperature, not compared to injury, not compared to nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, probably soil pH, and genetics. That's the reason why this pyramid exists, is that 
there can be slight bending. There can be we can push the numbers in our favor one way or the other, but don't do so. You know, in in lieu of doing the the prior treatments first, the prior parts of that pyramid first, and make sure those are at optimal levels first before you go down these roads of spending a lot of money on these other products that that may provide a benefit. And I'm going to show some papers that show a benefit, um, but they're usually specific to very unique cases. Whereas water is not specific to unique cases. Water is across the board. Okay. Light and temperatures across the board. Injuries across the board. Nitrogen's across the board. Okay. That's sort of the, the stepwise progression I'd like to impart on the audience. All right. The conclusions. And, and I highlighted all these conclusions only because Dr. Munshaw is a good author and he wrote a freaking good conclusion. So I got to read the whole dang thing. But, you know, that's the only reason it's highlighted is all, the whole thing's highlighted because it's really good the way he wrote it. This study provides strong evidence that late season nitrogen applications can have a beneficial effect on Bermuda grass color in the fall without negatively affecting cold tolerance using controlled freezing tests. Proline concentrations and fatty acid unsaturation levels were also unaffected by late season nitrogen applications, again indicating that nitrogen fertilization may not cause weaker plants that are more prone to winter injury. No beneficial effect on spring greenip was observed due to late season nitrogen application. That wouldn't be the case in every situation. There are clear, there's clearly evidence in the literature that shows there can be a little bit of a benefit here and there, but it's going to depend on species and the time of, time of year that you actually applied it. In this case, he didn't show any benefit of spring greenup from these late fall applications. We were unable to increase the duration of late season growth with seaweed extract. This treatment did not result in improved turf quality late in the growing season, there were also no consistent effects of seaweed extract on post-freeze regrowth, proline concentrations, lipid unsaturation, or spring greenup. I mean, you don't, you don't get more straightforward than that, guys. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, you might not have access to this paper. This, was paper. this paper was published in, where was this paper published? Crop Science? Yes, yeah, this paper was published, I should have said at the beginning, Crop Science in 2006. And you'll read that in the abstract for free, right? Um, I don't know, but I don't know if he says it so tersely in, in, in the abstract as he does in the conclusions. I thought that was a great sit, a great paragraph. Iron treatments resulted in increased turf, turf grass quality over the control, but only late in the growing season. This is a beneficial response since late season color retention and quality was a desired outcome. Late season iron treatments had no consistent effect on post-freeze regrowth, proline concentrations, or lipid unsaturation. So basically what I'm saying is, it, you're coloring the grass a little bit, but it's not really having any internal um, effect of the grass, which again supports my uh, hypothesis that a lot of the color from iron is actually occurring on the outside, the outside of the leaf. Bermuda grass cultivars vary tremendously in terms of quality, recuperate, recuperative capacity, and cold tolerance. Although previous research has shown differences among these cultivars in terms of cold tolerance, little physiological explanation have been offered. These results show that <clears throat> show that cultivars that are known to be cold tolerant produce higher levels of linolenic acid and proline during the fall and winter months. Now, I didn't show the differences among cultivars because that's really Dr. Munshaw's thing. You know, I, but what he's saying is there are differences among cultivars, even within the plant. And um, this paper had a lot more information in there that I didn't go into on that topic. But if you want to go into that, feel free. But that's not my lane. <laughs> so. Um, so that's that. Basically, the summation is spend your money on cultivars, spend your money on genetics. You know, if you think you're going to uh, benefit or add something or get something out of applying seaweed extract to Bermuda grass in Virginia, uh, the chances are pretty low. If you're looking for, I mean, for the fall to, to uh, sort of buffer the stress of going into d dormancy, you know, light and temperature stressors are going into dormancy or light and temperature shifts coming out of dormancy, um, there was no benefit measured in this particular study from the seaweed extract. Okay, and this won't be the last paper that we review from Virginia Tech. They did a lot of papers in that time, that part of the early 2000s, and there's at least, I don't know, two or three more papers we're going to go over from that group in, at Virginia Tech. So, um, so that's that, guys. Uh, let me look at the chat, see if there's anything you want me to go over. Uh, let's see. So 
Grass Factor says, I believe it was Virginia Tech showed a delayed onset of drought stress with kelp. However, the initial timing and reapplication interval was tight. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm familiar with that specific one. I, there's the only reason I'm saying that, Matt, is because there's like five papers from Virginia Tech, and I don't remember exactly which paper you're referring to. Um, there was another. There's another paper in 2004, actually, um, by Dr. Irvin. There's in Zhang, and there's two or three all at the same time there by Zhang. And I'll go over. I have those in the in the uh, folder to go over, but I don't remember if that's specific one you're talking about is the one that i'm going to be going over okay okay um i'm gonna let you go for the day tomorrow night 9 p.m please just come with an open mind i'm not you know nothing's recorded it's for you guys it's not for me it's it's i just want to do my do my part to you know foster a, a a warm community of just open thoughts and and conversation on turf grass um there's no judgments placed you know there's you know just if you want to show up and just have a conversation great if you want to lead it if you have some topic that you want to go over please feel free tomorrow night at 9 p.m for members only if you want to be, you want to participate in that you'll need to be a member then go to the community tab and you'll see the link for zoom on on the community tab and until then i will leave you with some music and i will see you all tomorrow night at uh, nine on zoom See ya.